Amen. All right, so here we are in Genesis chapter 38. This is kind of an odd chapter if you, if you know the whole chronology of, of, the, of the book of Genesis because we were introduced last week to Joseph and the things that were happening, and now we just get this story that's plugged in here in Genesis 38 about Judah. I mean, this is all about Judah and, and his wife. And then we go back into Genesis 39. It's going to pick up right back into the story of Joseph and everything else that goes on. So it's kind of odd. But I don't think it's that odd because in Genesis 37, one of the last things that happened is when Joseph was sold into slavery. And if you remember, it was Judah's idea to actually sell him into slavery. Now, Reuben had said, you know, at first they wanted to kill him. And they're like, let's kill this dream. You know, here come this dreamer. Let's kill him. And then we'll see what's going to happen to his dreams. And Reuben's like, well, no, like, well, let's just cast him into this pit. And his plan was to come back later and, you know, and let him out of the pit. But then you know, Reuben's off doing something else. They see the Ishmaelites coming. And Judah says, hey, what profit is there to kill him? Let's sell him into slavery. So it was really Judah's idea then to have Joseph sold. Now we're picking up into, into this story all about Judah. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through because he doesn't have the best life you know, going on now. We know that, that the, the wickedness and the sin that we sow, we're going to end up reaping those things. God's going to make sure that our punishment comes back and gets us and that we don't just get away with anything. And now look, you can be saved and you know, you're, you're eternally separated from your sins. You don't have to worry about that punishment of hell. But that doesn't mean, like so many people have this false concept when we preach the gospel that, oh, so you can just do whatever you want then and it's fine. And people will use that term. It's okay. So you could just sin and it's okay. No, and I always, you always got to correct them. No, it's not okay. No, it's not just fine to just go out and sin. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you're saved, you don't have to face that punishment of hell. But I'm not saying it's just fine to go off and sin. Is there any sin that you could do once you're saved that could send you to hell? No. But that doesn't mean you face zero consequences for your actions. God still will, will bring a punishment back your way. You're going to end up reaping what you sow. And when you, when you reap to the wind, you're going to sow. The, you're, when you sow to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. And we're going to see here with Judah's, with Judah's life as we get into this chapter, just kind of keep that in mind that he's the one that sold Joseph into slavery. And we start to see a lot of character flaws in Judah in this chapter. But let's start reading in verse number one. The Bible says, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. So right off the bat, he's, he becomes friends with this guy, Hira. He's an Adolamite. He leaves Israel, he leaves his brethren, and he goes and just befriends this, this other heathen guy and just spends a lot of time with him. And, and you know, earlier in the, in the previous chapters, we see a lot of problems when people make friends with these worldly people. We saw Dinah went to go see the daughters of the land. Next thing you know, she's shacking up with Shechem. And... The, the bad influences that, that the wrong friends can have in your life. Now we see here Judah. He's hanging out with this guy, Hira. And let's see what happens in verse 2. The Bible reads, And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in under. So now he takes this, this Canaanite woman to be his wife. And um, it doesn't say that they're actually married, but you know, he takes her to be his concubine or his wife or what have you. He takes this, this woman who is of the heathen of the land and he has children with her. Verse 3 says, And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. Now, I don't know exactly what the significance of this, but I caught this when I was studying. And I thought it was kind of interesting that, that he names the firstborn child, but then she named the secondborn child. And it just says, because he called his name Ur, and then she called their secondborn Onan. And it's kind of funny because that's similar to the way that we name our children in our family, that we kind of take turns on, on who gets to name the children. But then look at verse number, and you know, that's neither here nor there. That's just kind of funny. I thought it was kind of interesting that, that they're, you know, they're both naming the children. And... Um, Verse number five says, And she yet again conceived and bare a son, and called his name Shelah. And he was at Kizib when she bare him. So now we see, you know, it doesn't give you any of the details of why he's not there. But she's giving birth, and Judah's just out of town somewhere. So he, she's giving birth to a child. And we've noticed this. This has been another minor theme of, of, the, of the story of Israel in Genesis. Is we see how people are turning out 
when you don't spend time with your children, when you're not there to properly raise them, especially the father. We saw with, with Jacob and his children, we saw that the fact that he loved Rachel the most and then Leah and then the concubines. And we saw last week with the, with the story of Joseph that it was the, the, really the children of the concubines who seemed to be, who appeared to be the most wicked as opposed to the children of the one that, that Jacob loved the most. And it only makes sense that, well, if Jacob loves them the most, he's probably spending the most time with them. He probably cares about them the most and is giving them the most fatherly attention to raise them properly, and the other ones are kind of just gone by the wayside. I mean, think about it. That's what happens these days with, with people that have children out of wedlock and, and the, the mother and the father aren't together, whether they get divorced or whether they were never married to begin with, that there's not a very good opportunity when there's not a solid family, when you don't have a man and a woman married to each other and nobody else in the one house to raise the, to raise the children. When you got these kids kind of out there and maybe every once in a while they get to see their parents, they tend to have a lot more problems. And it's true. The Bible says, you know, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he shall not depart from it. Rearing up and training a child is extremely important. That's why, you know, as we go through different verses of the Bible that refer to a woman's role, in today's society, women get all up in arms, they get all upset, and they think that you hate women, all this other stuff. It is one of, it is the most important job to be raising up children, to be raising up unto the Lord. And the woman's job when they're, you know, when you're married and you become a mother, that is your, your, your main focus and objective. Yes, you need to take care of the household and other things, but the, the main important role that you have is to raise up those children. Now, it doesn't absolve the father. The father's role is extremely important also, but by virtue of the roles that we have, the husband needs to be making the income, so he's not going to be there all the time. He needs to be a way to do things sometimes, but when, you're, when he is around, he also needs to be investing a lot of time with that child. And we see the, the fruits of that when the, when the father's not around. And we see here, we don't know, again, we don't know how much, you know, I don't, I don't want to read too much into this story that's not there in Scripture, but we do see that the Bible does make mention that, hey, he wasn't even there when his, when his son was born. He was gone in Kizid. For what reason or another, I don't know. But um, he wasn't even there. And then we see, look at verse number um, 6. It says, And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Verse 7, And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. So we see here his firstborn son, Ur, is so wicked that God himself actually just decides to have him killed. God kills Ur, his firstborn. Now, I can't even imagine how bad someone must be, how wicked a person must be just for God to decide, yeah, I'm just going to kill him now. We know the long suffering and the mercies that God has. You read the book of Psalms and you read all about it. The extreme mercy and forgiveness that God has towards everybody in general. To see that one person then is just, he's just wicked. God just says, you know what? I'm done. I've had it. And he, and he takes his life. Now, was Ur saved? I don't know. But um, he was bad enough for God to kill him. And what that tells me is that Judah wasn't doing his job. I don't think that Judah raised his son right to be that wicked and to be so wicked that God himself is just saying, I'm just going to kill him. I'm just going to take his life. And it wasn't just uh, Ur. We see here, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. Now, this is the first time we come across this concept of raising up seed unto someone else's brother. This is before, this is prior to Moses. This is prior to the Mosaic Law. But we find elements of the Mosaic Law in Genesis and in, you know, in these earlier times before the law is introduced. And I believe that there are some things that they knew that were like commandments of God in the Old Testament before Moses actually wrote down the books and, and the law was given in that sense. I believe that there are things that they knew that they were supposed to be taken care of and they were supposed to be following that God had, had revealed unto them. They just weren't written down as part of the law. And I think that this is one of those things. But if you turn to Deuteronomy 25, we'll see where this is part of the law about raising up seed unto your brother. 
Because what, what happens here is that you got to understand the structure of the family and everything, especially in, in these days. The firstborn son is the one that would receive the double portion. He was the one that would receive, you know, the, the double portion of the inheritance. The other sons would get would would receive an inheritance as well, but that firstborn is the one that's like the one that's to carry on the father's name and everything else. And um, he's like the new the patriarch of the family. It's the firstborn son, is typically the way that it goes. Well, if that firstborn son, like here, he married a woman, but they didn't have any children. So in order to, to keep the name alive in, in, in memory of, of the, the son, the firstborn son that died, it's the brother's job then to, to, it's his duty. It's not a requirement, but it's his duty. It's something he ought to do to take his brother's wife then to marry her. And then the firstborn child that they have together, firstborn son, is actually like belongs to the deceased brother. It's, it's, it's you know it's it's after him. It's not after his own firstborn son. That's the way that's the way that it's looked at. We see that in Deuteronomy 25, uh, verse number five. The Bible reads, "If brethren dwell together, and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her." So there, the Bible calls it. It's it's his duty. It's his job. He's supposed to do that. And verse 6 says, And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. But then it says it also gives, um, you know, some, if, if he doesn't want to do it, verse 7 says, And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loose. So it's, an ex it's a very big shame for the brother not to take his brother's wife unto him if, you know, in this event, in this situation. It's his duty. It's his responsibility. It's his obligation. It's something he's supposed to do. But if he doesn't do it, it's not like there's a, you know, a beating or, or some other like a crime punishment that's associated with it. It's just an extreme shame. You, see, you know, you're just putting your family name to shame and he even has to change his name. So, you know, it's, you're, the, you're the one who's, whose shoe is loosed. So everyone knows you as, as the guy who didn't want to perform the duty. The guy who doesn't have the integrity and, and his family to be able to stand up and do his job and do his duty. And that's what you're going to be known as. And you get spit in the face. And, um, you know, so it was, some, it, was, it was a responsibility. It was something he was supposed to do. And I believe that just as much as that's written here is that they believe that to be true here also because Judah's telling his son, Onan, oh, he's saying, okay, you need to do this duty. You need to you know, marry your brother's wife. You need to raise up a child unto him. And he knew that. But here's what happens with Onan because Onan had a wicked heart too. Verse 9 of Genesis 38. Go back to Genesis 38. Verse 9 says, And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. He knew it. It was established. This is something they already knew was supposed to happen. And he knew that the child would not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. So God kills Onan now too. He First he kills Ur, now he kills Onan. But you see, Onan's problem... He didn't say, I'm not going to go in unto my brother's wife. He didn't say, I'm not going to do it. Because he did go in unto his, his brother's wife. He just didn't want to give the, the child unto his brother. So he was all fine with having that physical relationship with her and being married unto her. He just didn't want to raise up the child unto his brother. Basically, he wanted to have a physical relationship without having a child. This is exactly what now it may not be for the exact same reasons that that Onan had, but basically anyone who's using birth control is using it because 
they want to have a physical relationship with someone of the opposite sex and not have a child as a result. Right? I mean, that's why you take birth control to control yourself from having a child. This is exactly what Onan was doing. He says, I want to have this relationship with this woman. I'm all for it. That's great. But I just don't want to have the child. Now, this is the only time that you will ever find a situation where somebody is practicing a method or a form of birth control in the whole Bible. And the result of that is God killing him. God being displeased and Onan dies as a result of him using this birth control. Now, I've heard people say, well, no, no, God just killed him because he didn't want to raise up the child unto his brother. I don't think that that reason matters as much. Now, that is part of it, of course, but I don't think that that matters as much as he should have just not taken her to wife at all then if he wasn't going to do it. The fact that he wanted to do this act and then not follow through with the whole thing and committed this sin, God killed him for it. Take that to heart when you decide whether you're married or not. If you're going to start using birth control. Now look, if you're not married, you ought not to be engaging in the act at all because that's a, that's, that's a whole other thing called fornication. And God is not... And if you're saved, you ought to be deathly afraid. You ought to have a fear of God that says, I am not going to even step close to, to fornication. You ought to have the fear of God instilled in you so deep because God has been known to, to, to take people's lives, even that they're saved, to take them home early because they're just not doing what he's telling them to do and, and they're just deliberately disobeying God. They're completely disobeying him. And fornication is a very serious sin. Very serious sin. It's not something to be taken lightly. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time preaching on fornication today. I want to get this point rammed home for if you are married, and you do have this, this relationship that you ought not be using birth control. You ought not be saying, well, I want to have this relationship with my wife, but I don't want to have a child. And people have all kinds of different reasons why they don't want to have a child to say, well, you know, we can't afford it right now. That's probably the biggest thing. I don't know, you know, I don't make that much money and we already have a couple of children. I don't know how I'm going to afford this child. And people get scared. They have fear. And as I mentioned last week, you know, out of fear, people will, will make oftentimes the wrong decision because you're letting fear control you. It's not a fear of God. You have a fear of, of something else, of someone else, or of something else that's going to happen. But the Bible says that it, um, for the, in the righteous man, we read this last week in, in Psalm 37, actually on Sunday night. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 37. I want to review this real quick for everyone that's here today that wasn't here on Sunday night. You have no reason to fear. The Bible says that, that um, I think it's in either Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, I've been old and not, I've been young and now I'm old and I've, I've yet to see the, the, um, his children forsaken or, or his, the righteous forsaken or his, his children begging bread. I forget exactly how the, I'm, I'm misquoting it now. But um, God promises promises to feed us and to clothe us and to take care of us. And the Bible says that children are um, a blessing. <laughs> that children are an, an um, man, I'm stumbling over my words. Look if you would at Psalm 37 where, where I had you turn. It says in verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. This is a verse that you can take a lot of confidence and a lot of, a lot of joy in and a lot of comfort in. The fact that, hey, if you're doing what's right according to the Bible, God will lift you up. God will hold you there. Even if you fall down, God will help you up. And if you're doing what's right, and if you see that this story in Genesis says, hey, you know, Onan was practicing birth control and he ended up dying, obviously God doesn't seem to look too well on that. I'm going to just let things happen. I'm going to let God open and close the womb as he's done all throughout the Bible. When people can't have children, they pray unto God, God opens up their womb. Something else happens and God decides to close the womb. 
God has control over whether or not a person has children or not. You don't need to worry about whether or not you're capable of supporting the children. You just need to do what's right and not do these wicked things and get involved with, with trying to play God and say, well, I'm going to be in charge of when the womb is open and closed. And I'm going to use these, these wicked devices, the, the, the birth control methods that have been created by man, in order to control whether or not we have children. God will, will be there to take care of you. You will not be begging. If you're doing what's right, if you're living a godly life, if you're going to church, if you're going soul winning, and if you're just having a normal relationship with your wife, which results in children, you don't have to worry about how you're going to take care of them. I mean, keep working hard. I'm not saying just quit your job and everything else and God's just going just gonna, to you know, cut you a, wealth, a welfare check. But if you're doing what's right, then you know that your steps are ordered by the Lord, that God is watching what's going on and he's very interested in your life and he has a plan for your life and he's not going to let the, you, know, you lose, your, um, lose your house or lose your food or clothing because you have another child. He'll help you to take care of them. You may not be able to see how that's going to happen at the time, but that's where the faith comes in. You need to trust in God that, hey, he's capable of taking care of this thing. But whatever the reason is, I don't think that matters. The, the bottom line is what we see in this story is that Onan was willing to have the relationship but didn't want to have the results of it, didn't want to have that child. And God ended up killing him as a result. So if you want to turn and, and if, you, if you are the type of person that says, you know what, I'm going to make all of my decisions based on Scripture, based on the Bible because I care what God says and I am just interested in doing what's right. If you're going to use these words, because sometimes it may be kind of hard, depending on your situation, what you're, what's going on in your life, to come up with a very clear or good example from the Bible on, um, on the exact situation that you're in, that you're trying to decide what's the right thing to do, right? We oftentimes have to fall back on biblical principles in order to make our decisions. And usually the reason why it's difficult is because you're involved in it. If you were a third person standing outside and someone were to come to you with the same exact question, it's usually a lot easier for you to understand what's the right thing to do. And it's a good tactic, by the way, too, if you're really struggling with something and you don't know what you should be doing. Because think about it, you have, you have your own carnal motives for doing things sometimes and oftentimes we have a, a desire to justify our sins so when you when you come to a crossroads for for whatever reason and you, i have to make this decision i don't know exactly what's right to do think about what you would tell someone else if they just came into you with the exact same question and they said hey here's my situation what do you think what do you think is the right thing to do what do you think is a scriptural thing to do it's a good way to look at your own issues. But here we have a situation, a very specific one, that a lot of people deal with, especially in today's society. Because the, the, the worldly norm is they'll tell you, you know, you can have a couple of kids, but don't have too many. You know, that's just a burden to society. And, you know, there's no way, you, you know, you're going to be doing them a disservice if you have too many children. You're not going to give them enough attention. They're not going to have a proper education. You know, all of these things that the world is going to throw at you to try to get you to limit how many children that you have. That is the worldly wisdom. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that children are inherited to the Lord. That's the word that I couldn't think of. <laughs> And that, and that uh, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. That, that, um, he says, blessed are the children of the youth, and happy is the man that, that hath his quiver full of them. You're happy if you have a lot of children. That was a blessing in the old times. When, when, um, Rebecca was sent away, she was blessed with having, you know, being the mother of thousands of millions. That's what they wanted her to have. That's what they wanted her to see. That was a great blessing for her, to have lots of children, to have a great big house. Hey, it was a blessing back then. It's still a blessing today, regardless of what the world says. Children are a great thing to have, and don't worry about where your finances are going to come from or how am I going to deal with, with raising them and everything else. Look, it is an important job. I'm not saying that, that you, don't, you don't even have to think about it how you're going to raise them because it's very important how to do it. But if you're going by scripture, you know, you're not going to go wrong. And here's a situation where we have this, this one time it happens of the exact scenario of someone wanting to have a physical relationship without children and God ends up killing them. I think that's a pretty clear cut case to say, if I'm going to decide and make my decisions based on the Bible, that this is a pretty good indication that God's probably against me using birth control. 
Pretty good sign. I mean, God, he didn't, he didn't just, you know, reprimand him in a way. He took his life away. There's nothing else he can do. He took his life away from him. He's dead. That doesn't, that God doesn't do that very often, even in the Bible. I mean, you could count on one hand the number of times he does that to people where the Bible sp explicitly is saying, yep, God stepped in and took this guy's life. We see two of them happening right here, and they're the sons of Judah. Let's keep reading here. I think we left off in verse number 10. Let's look at verse number 11. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, lest peradventure he die also as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So he's saying, okay, you know, Shelah was younger than the other two sons that he had. And he's saying, you know, go back to your father's house, stay there, remain a widow. And when Sheila's grown up, then he'll be given to you to wife. Because this was what they were supposed to be doing. I mean, she didn't, she didn't have children by either one of those, of those men. But she was married to both of them. So now the next one in line was Sheila. But he wasn't of age to actually take her to wife yet. So she agrees to that. Okay, she goes and dwells at her father's house. Verse 12. And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. So then Judah's wife dies. And Judah was comforted, went up unto his sheep shearers to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. So he's still hanging out with Hira. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. So basically what happens here is that Judah just kind of forgets about his daughter-in-law. He doesn't, he, she's not very much of a priority. And he just kind of forgets about her. And then he goes up to here to Timnath and he's working and shearing his sheep. Verse 14, And she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. So she sees what's going on and she's saying, okay, he should have been, she should have been given unto him to wife by now. He's already grown up. He's a man. He can take her to wife, but Judah's not doing anything about it. And up to this point, it appears that she's been wearing her widowhood clothing. So people know that, that she's a widow and she's waiting for um, this man to, to grow up and, and she was going to marry him. But this isn't happening. So she goes up there and she, she removes her wedding, wed or wedding widow, widow clothing and goes up to confront Judah. It says in verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot because she had covered her face. Now I want to take this point real quick. When it says he thought her to be a harlot, how did, what did he think about her? Like, was she a harlot, first of all? No. She wasn't a harlot. She was, she was his daughter-in-law. And she was doing what was right. As far as we can tell from this whole story, she was doing what was right. She was wearing her clothing of widowhood. She was waiting and, and just waiting to be given unto Sheila to be his husband, her, his wife. And she was waiting. She was doing what was right. But when he sees her, see, he, she dresses in a certain way. And he looks at her, and he thinks that she's a harlot. Now, and then he approaches her as a harlot and, and tries to get her to, you know, to, to lay with him, which she ends up doing. But it's all based on the way that she looks. Now, women need to understand, if you're going to look like a harlot, expect to be treated like a harlot. And this is recently, they had that, that slut walk thing, and I've mentioned this before, that... Um, these women, they, they, they go real far in the extreme on this feminist side. Well, we can basically walk around naked and that doesn't give you a right to rape us. Now look, it never excuses rape, but they completely miss the concept of, well, the more you're showing off, that's a, how do you expect to be treated? It doesn't, make, it doesn't make the rape justified. If someone forces a woman against her will, but it's just sheer stupidity to go around enticing men and, and enticing that type of behavior from somebody and think that, no, I could just walk around and everything's going to be just fine. I mean, you're, you're deceiving yourself if you think that this world isn't full of people that commit sin and do horrible things to other people and that will attack and violate other people. But besides that, I mean, it's just, I mean, obviously it's just wrong. I mean, those people, they don't believe the Bible at all. They don't believe in that the Bible, what the Bible even talks about when it refers to nakedness and, um, and being ashamed and everything else. But there's a certain way that you can dress. 
that people are going to think that you're a harlot. Proverbs 7 refers to, to a similar thing. You turn to Proverbs 7 real quick. We're going to see here, um, the Bible talks about a real harlot. In Proverbs 7, verse number 10, the Bible reads, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. So there, very clearly we see that there is a way that you can dress that looks like a harlot. And subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. This is a type of woman who is an adulteress, who is a harlot, a whore, a whore, a, you know, um, a slut, hooker. a hooker. Exactly. This is the type of person. This is what they're like. It says they're loud, they're stubborn, their feet don't abide at, how, at home, and they go up and they just, they're willing to just kiss strangers. And they're dressed in a particular way. The way that a harlot dress, I mean, think about it, this only makes sense. A harlot, a hooker, is there to make money because they're selling their body in, in order to make money. That's, that's their job. That's what they're going out there to do. So in order to do that, they're trying to entice a man to spend money to lay with her, right? Pretty simple enough. So the way that they dress is in a way that's going to be more revealing and, and wear things that will entice a man. Now look, if you're wearing things that you know that men like and you know that's going to entice a man, you're dressing like a harlot. There's lots of things that that could be. It could be the low-cut tops where you start you know, showing off a lot of cleavage. You're wearing dresses or you could even be dresses or skirt, but you're wearing them that are like super skin tight and you can see every curve of the body. Look, these type of things, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. And I don't want to hear from, you know, from a woman saying, well, I don't know what, what a man likes. Look, you know what men like. Don't tell me that you don't know uh, what's going what's gonna to arouse a man to get him to want to lay with you. Don't tell me that you're that ignorant. And fathers that have little children, you're not that ignorant. Don't let them walk around. And I don't care, like even my little girls, you're never going to see them dressed, walking around with an entire Harley say, but yeah, but no one's going to be looking at them. Little, yeah, no one but the sickos and weirdos, but I'm going to teach them from a young age not to be putting off a show and wearing things that they ought not to be wearing, whether or not they even understand it. Whether they understand the, the, the point or not. You see, these days you see these young girls, seven, eight, nine years old, they walk around like little hookers. And they don't even realize, it's real sad because they don't get it. They don't know. But they see their icons, their idols, these pop stars that are wearing almost nothing and they want to emulate them because they look up to them because they think they're so cool and they want to wear the same things. And they want to go out and be, and be all popular. The parents need to say no. You don't, you don't put up a for sale sign if it's not for sale. And women need to take this to heart and, and, and really analyze themselves. Analyze your own clothing and say, is what I'm wearing going to just entice a man and make him think that something I have is available to, to anybody for the right price? That's the attire of an harlot. Judah approaches his daughter-in-law. Because she changed what she was wearing, and she was, she was obviously doing this intentionally. Because she wasn't given unto his son in order to, to have children. I mean, she obviously really wanted to have children. She was trying to do the right thing, and he wasn't doing it. Now, I'm not condoning what she did either, and this method that she's doing to do this, but it's what she did. And she knew how to entice a man. She knew how to look like a harlot. And what does that say about Judah? Because Judah does go in unto her. And what, what more does that say about Judah's character? He goes in unto a harlot. I mean, we see clearly he wasn't raising his children very well, but now his wife dead. He says, oh, well, I'm going to go in on his harlot. <clears throat> Let's keep reading. Genesis 38. I don't know if you're in Proverbs, so flip back to Genesis 38. We're going to Keep reading here in verse number 
16. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? So now they're negotiating the price. He says, Well, I'll give you a kid from the flock. You know, that'll be your price. And then she said, Well, you don't have it with you, so what are you going to give me to pledge? Meaning, what are you going to give me now so that I know that after we do this, you really are going to, going to pay me? It's, yeah, it's collateral, exactly. So, you know, you've got to give me something, and it's got to be something that he, she knows he's going to want to get back. So that she could get paid, and then he says, um, and he said, "What pledge shall I give?" She asked you, "Well, what do you, what do you want? What do you want me to give you?" And she said, "Thy signet, and thy bracelets, and thy staff that is in thine hand." And he gave it her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. So she gets these these things from him that are unique to Judah, that is definitely identifying him, that they belong to him, his signet. You know, his ring, his, his insignia of it for his name or whatever, and, his, and these bracelets and his staff. They clearly belong unto Judah. So that, they, you know, she's taking things that, that can identify him later like you were the guy. And um, so they, they make this deal and then she becomes pregnant. She conceives seed. She's with child as a result of him laying with her. So then later on, when Judah gets back home, it says in verse 20, And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend the Adolamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her out. So he sends his friend off. He's, okay, well, you know, pay her. I promise her to get a kid of the goats, and, and you give her this, and then get my stuff back and come back. And verse 21 says, Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. So then he starts asking. He's like, You can't find this woman anywhere. He's like, Well, hey, what? Where was, where was the hooker that was, that was over here? And they're like, there's no harlots in this town. You know, like, there's, there's nobody like that here. And um, so he has to go back. He returns back to Judah, and he's like, I, I can't find her. I don't know what to say, you know? And, uh, you know, even the people of the place said that there was no harlot there. Verse 23, and Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and now it's not found her. So now he's starting to worry. He's like, look, I don't want to be, I'm, I'm holding my end of the deal. I don't want to be shamed by this. Verse 24, And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. So Judah finds out. People bring it to his attention that his daughter-in-law is now with child, which means... She hasn't been remaining a widow and waiting for his, son, you know, for his son to marry her. And now Judah's ready to cast his judgment on her. This reminds me exactly of the story in 2 Samuel 12. Turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel 12. We'll see the story of David. Because it's a pretty harsh judgment he passes on her, right? He said, well, let her be burnt. She's playing the whore. Let her be burnt. And Judah seems to be just fine in making that judgment call. Judah, who is raising his children two of which are killed by God himself, Judah, who turns in unto a harlot, is now saying, yeah, let her be burnt. Let her be killed. 2 Samuel chapter 12. we we'll start reading in verse number 1. This is what Nathan is sent unto David after he's committed adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David saw her, he, committed, he, he took her unto him, committed adultery with her, got her pregnant. Once he realized that she was with child, he wanted to cover up his sin, and he ended up having Uriah killed. Put to death. Murderous and adulterous. And here we see David now. Uh, Nathan comes unto him in, in 2 Samuel 12, look at verse number 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his own bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress it for the wayfaring man that was come unto him but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. 
And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. So we see David has no problem judging in another man's matters, right? He gets angry. He hears about this story. He says, you know, this family, they've got this lamb, and his, it was just like one of the family. They treated this lamb just like a daughter, you know, and ate with them and all this other stuff. It was this great family pet. That's all they had. This one lamb. This rich man had all kinds of, of cattle and, and sheep and goats, all this other stuff. So when his friend came in to visit, he didn't even want to kill any of his own stuff. He's like, well, let's just kill this guy's stuff. Let's take this lamb. And David hears that. He's enraged. He's, he's like, man, he's like, that guy is going to die and he's going to pay back fourfold. That's his judgment. Now look at what Nathan responds with. Verse 7, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. He said, Yeah, that guy that you want to kill, that you're so enraged about, that you think should pay back fourfold, that's you. You're that guy. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the son. And it goes on and on about his judgment. And then David responds in verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. But then he ends up killing the, the son that's as a result. And this story reminds me so much of what we just read here in Genesis um, 38 with Judah. Because... It's real easy for him to judge somebody else. But he doesn't judge himself at all, which is exactly what David was doing here. He had plenty of, of reasons to judge someone else in, in, in his matters. And the Bible says, you know, that if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But turn, if you would, to Matthew 7. It's the last place we'll turn. We're going to close out um, Genesis 38. As you learn more scripture, as you get more knowledgeable in the Bible, you start to learn right from wrong and, and you get real solid on it. And even as you start to get some sins out of your life, it can be easy to become extremely judgmental. And part of it comes from a haughty attitude. Now, I know that the Bible says that we are to judge righteous judgment, and I don't, you know, we're going to read Matthew chapter 7. People rip this out of context, and they say you're never supposed to judge and things like that. That's not me. But on the flip side, as much as, because this that really bothers me when people are like, oh, judge not, judge not, all this other stuff, and they, you know, they don't know the whole passage and, and what the context is, what it's even talking about, about not being a hypocrite when you judge. But don't take it to the other extreme to where you're just ready to judge everything and just, and just think that you can just be in judgment on absolutely everything and that you can do no wrong. We need to be careful with how we judge. It doesn't mean we can never judge. Just be careful with it. Let's, let's read Matthew 7, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Judge not that ye be not judged. So in order for you not to be judged, you're saying, okay, well, just don't, you know, don't judge, and then you won't be judged if you're not judging other people. He says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Whatever standard you're holding other people to, hey, that's a standard that's going to be used against you. David, who's holding this standard against a man who kills a lamb, when you killed this woman's husband? You killed a man? He just killed a lamb. You killed this husband. You took the one thing that was precious unto him. You're the king. You can have whatever you want. You took this guy, this poor guy's wife. And you're going to cast judgment on this guy that killed a lamb? 
That's how the story goes. And we see the same thing with Judah. Judah's going to cast judgment on his daughter-in-law when he's the one that went in unto her. He's the one laying with a whore. Let's keep reading here. It says, For with what judgment you, you meet, or with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Verse 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. You need to read all those verses in context. You can't just read judge not. You can't just read the first two words of verse 1. Obviously. The Bible's teaching us that when you do judge things, don't be a hypocrite. If you're going to judge something else, you better dead make sure that you are not guilty of the same thing or worse when you're judging someone else. Right? See, people will try to spin this around and say, oh yeah, see, the Bible says judge not so you can't judge the homos. Look, I'm not a homo. I've never been a homo. I can judge the homos. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have this beam in my eye of like, like I'm a sodomite and, and I'm, I'm this, you know, because that's what I always say. Well, you're just closet sodomite. Like, get out of here. That's, a, that's what they like to say to everyone because they have, they have nothing else to say. They have no argument against So, Well, you just must be one too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Everybody is. Everyone in the whole world is, Right. Except for those that say they just absolutely love them and accept them. Those are the only ones who truly aren't sodomites. Because if, if you actually have any type of disgust in your heart for the, the vile, disgusting acts that they do, then you just must be one too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. No, I can judge about that. I can judge about other things. But the sins that you're involved in or the, or, you know, the things that, that you have... Because look, none of us is perfect. We all have our own problems. Make sure that you're not bringing judgment against other people when, it's, when, when you're guilty of the same because that's going to come right back on you. And that's what you need to be cautious of and keep that in mind of when, when, you, know, when, you're, when you are judging. And it's, I'm not saying never to judge. There, there is a, a righteous judgment. You know, the Bible says, what is there not... Um, any among you that, that can judge in these matters. In 1 Corinthians, it's talking about the, the, the church and when things go wrong, you know, the, the church is supposed to be able to handle problems and you're supposed to be able to judge between matters. When, when someone does someone else wrong, that we should be able to judge what's right and what's wrong in those situations. We ought to be able to judge according to Scripture, according to God's law. But, be careful in, in how, you, how far you take that. And you think of even the, and I, didn't, I don't want to really get into this too much. I, went, I did an almost an entire sermon on um, the woman taken in adultery in John. And, um, you know, because people like to bring that up too. The whole reason that they even brought that woman up was they're trying to catch Jesus in his words. They're trying to trap Jesus and get him to say that he, he was either against Moses' law or he was going to take the law in his own hands and then be guilty under the Roman law. So one way or the other, they're trying to make it so that he didn't have a good answer, a good way out. But they're also just, just dragging this, this woman unto him who was taken in adultery in the very act, the Bible says. But they were there to try to kill, to basically, because they wanted Jesus dead. They had this big old beam in their eye. They were hypocrites trying to get judgment on this woman when they wanted the Son of God dead. But he said unto them, you know, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Obviously, a uh, very well-known story. And, and, you know, we do need to, to keep that in mind always in your own judgment as well of matters and especially with people. Okay, God is a forgiving God. And I know that I have been forgiven of a tremendous amount of things and of some very wicked things and very bad things. And like I said, as you get a little bit more mature spiritually, and you start to learn more, and, and you get a lot of sin out of your life, it's, it's easier to come down on people pretty hard. But I would just warn is be careful about that. Because that's not always the right, it's not, it's not always the right thing to do, first of all. 
You know, you want to help people. Sometimes you need, you know, they need to be confronted with their sin. Obviously, and that's that's what we do in church. You want to preach on a lot of sin to just confront you with that, so that you can you can be aware of it and you can make the change. But um, you know, just we're, our job isn't just to be tearing people down either for all their wicked works. You know, the the goal is to try to help them. We're going to call a spade a spade. I'm going to I'm going to read the Bible and and th you know, thus saith the Lord, Amen and Amen. But I'm not going to use it to beat somebody down. I'm going to use it to try to help them and say, hey, you know, you might be an error on this, but I'm here to help you, brother. You know, let's let's get this taken care of. So let's flip. Let's finish out the, the chapter here in uh, in Genesis 38. So Judah's saying, let her be burnt. Let's just kill her. Light her on fire, because that's what she deserves. Verse 25, when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? She's saying, okay, you want to kill me? Well, I'll let, I'll let this speak for itself. Whoever, whoever owns this, that's the father of the child. She said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff, and Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. And he knew her again no more. He realized what he did, obviously, that, that it wasn't right for him not to give her to his son. But then because, because of this whole thing, it kind of she's polluted. She is essentially, in a way, is like kind of become his wife in that event. Now, I, I don't believe that just when you, when you lay with someone, they're automatically a wife. There's people that believe that. I don't hold to that at all. Um, that's why there's a sin called fornication. If you were married, it wouldn't be fornication. But um, she's, been, she's been polluted, though. And that was a, that's a sin. You know, lying with your daughter-in-law is, is, is a big sin. The Bible says, you know, not to do that. Um, you know, to discover your son's nakedness by lying with, with your daughter-in-law. But because of all of that, I mean, he already did it, but basically now he's got to take care of his children and her as if she was his wife because, because of this whole event, but he never, he never lays with her again. So, um, it's, uh, and that's why he knew her again no more. Verse 27, And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharez. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Now, I'm just going to take the last few minutes of this sermon for this. Because this is a really cool story, I think, with the, with the twins being born, how the one baby is able to stick its hand out. And they, since they knew it was twins, they're, saying, they're, they're trying to mark and identify the firstborn. Right? Because twins are going to look, they're going to look exactly the same. So when they come out, you're going to be like, well, which one was born first? I don't know. But it's important to know who the firstborn is, as I was mentioning earlier. So the one baby sticks out its hand. They're like, ah, this is the firstborn. They tie a thread around it real quick. But then somehow the other twin was able to, to maneuver its way. And if you know anything just about biology or anatomy of, of a woman, like to, for the other baby to be like in that, you know, to kind of switch places at birth, that was kind of an amazing thing anyways for him to, to come out first. And they were kind of surprised at that. So that uh, Pharaoh is, is named after like, well, how did, you, how did you come through first? You know, the other one was there. And then um, Zara is born. And the only point I want to make with this is that, you know, we see in the Bible midwives delivering children and no cause to, you know, have this medical emergency and go to the hospital and everything. This is a natural, normal thing that God has designed. God has designed women to bear children. And he designed them to give birth. It's a natural thing. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing, you're not sick. You don't need to go to the doctor because you have this illness that he needs to fix you of. You have a baby. You have a child. And God designed the woman's body great in order to have those children and, and, and to be done in, in a normal, a safe manner. Now, is there a time for a hospital or emergency? Yeah, you know, sometimes those things happen. 
right? Just like there, we have accidents, just times like other things happen that are way out of the ordinary, that are not normal to happen. But God designed things pretty well. I mean, when God saw everything that he made, it was good. And when God to call something good, you better believe it was good. He's made our bodies incredibly. So to think that, you know, it, we've been kind of brain, the society's been brainwashed into thinking that you automatically need to go to this other institution where sick people go in order for you to have your baby. And you need to be put on this bed, on your back, and your legs up. This is the only way, this is the safest way, the only way you should be having your child. And I don't believe that for a second. That's why we do home births, because it's a completely normal, natural thing to do, and that God has designed us in a way. And look, it's the same thing with the vaccinations and these other things that they want to give the children when they're born. I don't believe for a second that God has, was so inept, so inept that we need to have injections with needles of things shot into us as, a, as, a, as an infant, as a newborn baby, because if we don't, we'll just die. If we don't, then, then you know, we're going to spread all these horrible diseases and everything else. Look, God made us pure and clean, and he has a whole immune system that he designed in order for us to deal with disease and in order to deal with, with infections. The problem is, is that when a, when a society turns wicked, guess what? God will send a pestilence. And when God decides to do that, no vaccine is going to help you. No injection is going to stop that. It's going to happen no matter what. When his judgment comes down upon a nation. But God designed us from the beginning. That's why we don't inject things. That's why we don't, don't say, oh, you need to have all this stuff for a newborn baby. No, you don't. God made it fine. God made these kids just fine. They don't need any of that stuff. You don't need heavy metals pumped into their bodies. I'm going to go with the way God designed things. And I'm going to try to just, just help what he does. And that's the I believe it's the best approach to health is trying to support what God created. Support the immune system. Support your nutrition. He gave you a body to eat food, to consume food, to give you energy and strength and, and, and everything else. That's what he designed for us to do. Let's make sure that the fuel we're putting in is good fuel. And, and everything else, God's, God's made a way to work. I think it's a, the best philosophy to go off of. I think it's a biblical one, knowing that God has created us and he's created us to work a certain way and that we don't need to be meddling in everything that, that he's created to try to improve upon it. Right? Try to improve upon God's creation. Yeah, good luck with that. You think you make improvements and you're going you're gonna to be falling backwards. You're going to be tinkering and messing up things that you didn't realize were going to be a problem. Just like with the genetically modified food and everything else, they think, oh yeah, we're going to make this, this tomato, it's going to be super huge and we're going to be able to feed people everything else. And then, oh yeah, didn't quite think of these other ramifications of the, of the genetically modified organism that gets in your body. Now it's starting to cause cancer because your body wasn't designed to work with something that's modified in that way. And, and you're introducing all kinds of other problems that were unforeseen consequences because you think you could improve on God's creation. But I'm getting way off on a rabbit trail. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to, to, to preach tonight for us all to come together, dear God. I pray that you would please just... Um, Continue to teach us through your word. Help us to have biblical viewpoints on everything that we do, on all the decisions that we make, dear Lord, that we wouldn't be um, so haughty as to think that, that we can do better than what you've already done. Help us also not to get sucked into the philosophy of this world, into thinking that you know, there's something wrong with having children, or to be so fearful as to think that we can't support children, dear Lord. When you said that they're a blessing, when you said it's something good to have, dear Lord, and that you've commanded to be fruitful and multiply. Lord, help us just to have faith, to have a proper fear of you and not to fear about all these other things that could happen, but to trust and to know that you'll order our steps, you'll take care of us, dear Lord, and that we can just, in simpleness of faith, just trust you and do what's right. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.